Kastuba Das here with a big announcement for Wisdom of the Sages listeners. This August will be Ashram Month at the Super Soul Farm. Simple ashram living, rising early, morning kirtan, yoga and pranayama, healthy vegan and vegetarian meals, farm seva and being immersed in nature, and then gathering in the evenings for kirtan and readings. Plus, each week we'll have a lead presenter teaching a different facet of the philosophy and lifestyle of bhakti yoga. Week number one will be the exceptional bhakti lata teaching a course called The Beauty of Bhakti, bringing the culture of love and devotion into our lives. Week number two is my brother from another mother, Raghunath, teaching Falling in Love with Divinity, the Bhakti Yogi's method for opening the heart. And week number three is myself with a course called Following the Path, examining the history and teachings of Bhakti Yoga. You can come for one, two, or all three weeks, and the pricing is by donation. For more dates and information, go to wisdomthesages.com slash events. Peace. Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kastuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga, wisdom, and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archive classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Live from New York City, hot New York City. It's burning up in the city now. This is Kasturba Das, and this is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast. Raghunath's not here with us today, but we have a special guest, Chaitanya Char, the spiritual scientist, who we'll be speaking to very soon as our uh, interviewee. Mara, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. Is it hot up there also? So hot. <laughs> okay. It just became summer overnight. Yeah, it did. It became the middle of the summer overnight. Um, so, Mara, what's happening? Do we have some announcements for today before we get into the interview? We do. We have our Bhakti Recovery Group meeting is at 930. Um, okay. The Irvin Davy Women's yeah. Group is meeting via the Bhakti Center. That's at 1130 a.m. Is it 1130 to 1? Is that how? Yeah, yeah I think, I think so. so. Yeah. And then for our Patreon members, uh, Yamuna Bihari is offering a Marma workshop today at 2 p.m. Okay. And he's also offering another workshop tomorrow evening called the Yoga of Eating. An Ayurvedic wow. perspective to food, and that'll be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for Patreon members. That's the kind of yoga that people like, right? Yes. Yoga of eating. Bring it right I down to the most also. fundamental <laughs> aspects of life. I guess breathing is there too, but eating is important also. <laughs> okay, that's it for now? Yep. Thank you, Mara. So, uh, everybody, today we have, uh, you know, a dear friend, a regular guest on the show. And, and, you know, it was a little while ago that Raghunath and I said, you know, Chaitanya Charampuru, he's someone that we, we can't just have him every now and then. He's someone that we got to keep bringing back. He's got so much to offer, and, and he's prolific. Chaitanya Charan is he's a monk, uh, a dear friend of ours who come, he's, comes out of the ashram of the Radha Gopinath Temple, which is where, you know, it's, it's a, a temple community led by Radha Swami in Mumbai, and, and it's where Raghunath and I, for, for decades now, it, it's been a real source for us, for friendship, for inspiration, and so on. And they have a, a large ashram of monks there, and Chaitanya Charan is one of the senior monks, but a brilliant person. He's a, a mentor and a spiritual author with a degree in electronics and telecommunications engineering. And he's a world traveler. He, he travels all over, speaking at the world's top universities and companies, sharing his wisdom of the yoga tradition. He's the author of over 20 books, um, and every day he writes and publishes a 300-word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita that's posted on his website, uh, gitadaily.com. 
and you can go there and find over 3,000. It's probably well over 3,000 of his Gita meditations. Five he writes art. Yeah, how many? 5,000 now, actually. Oh, 5,000. Okay, <laughs> impressive. And um, his articles have been published in many of the important Indian newspapers, including the Indian Express, the Economic Times, and the Times of India in the Speaking Tree column. And that Speaking Tree column is like a really big thing in India. You see it all over. It's like a, it's a very um, well-known uh, column. He also, you can also vis visit his website, thespiritualscientist.com, where he answers questions by seekers. And there you're going to find many thousands of recorded videos and, uh, and hundreds of articles that he's written. And so, as I mentioned, he's a very prolific person, but he's, you know, he, he's a friend of mine, you know, on the heart level. I, I love having him here just as a friend. But um, it's amazing. Uh, he, he's an amazing thinker, and, he, and he, he takes the same books and philosophies that we've been reading for, for, for many years, and he has... You know, he applies his, his scientific or his engineering mind to them. And with this, he's able to really categorize and just, you know, sometimes it can be so, um, I don't know, revealing uh, when someone who's been studying the same thing that you're studying just frames it in a new way, in, in a really clear way, and, and everything starts to snap into place. And Chaitanya Charan Prabhu really has the ability to do that over and over again. So uh, we're, we're, we're really thrilled to have you back. Welcome back, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. It's I often hear your podcasts and the wisdom of the sages is going to go into the history of the bhakti movement as one of the <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, you could say trendsetters in how to present uh, bhakti in a very appealing as well as faithful way appealing to the audience faithful to the tradition so it's always my honor and pleasure to be here with you that's very Thank generous you for of you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Prabhu, I want to start by bringing up the fact. I mentioned that you have over 20, you've, you've authored over 20 books, but how many is the total? Okay, uh, it's uh, 26 right now, 26 actually, and two more are going to be published soon. Okay, so you've, so. you've, you've published 26 books, written and published 26 books, but uh, there are two that are just waiting in the pipe and they're about to come out. Um, yeah, by this next week, actually. Oh, by next week. Okay. And these yeah. both of these books, I don't know how he writes so many books. <laughs> That's really <laughs> impressive. But um, uh, these next two books are about the Bhagavad Gita, correct? Yes. And what are they so, called? Okay, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, the book which I have connected with the most. Hmm. So uh, I'm calling these two books as Relishing Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita Insights. Okay. Relishing, so the, relishing Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita Insights. These books are not yet published, but they will be available very soon. Yeah, so they approach the Gita from, we could say, two distinct perspectives. We could say the, the Bhagavad Gita uses the word mind and intelligence many times. Mai arpita mano buddhir. Mm -hmm. That offer your mind and your intelligence to me. Okay. So we could roughly equate the mind with the emotional faculty. It's not a mm -hmm. very precise equivalent, but... Uh, but roughly, and the intelligence with the rational faculty. Okay. So the relishing Bhagavad Gita approaches and studies the book from the emotional side. We focus on how the Bhagavad Gita, although it's a philosophical book, it is actually uh, an expression of the loving relationship between Krishna and Arjuna. Mm -hmm. So how their relationship is manifested, developed, and ultimately made more intimate by the end of the Gita. So that, that is what I trace in relishing Bhagavad Gita. Very interesting. And, um, and I'll just complete that and then we can just go. So and yeah. in Bhagavad Gita Insights, I'm approaching it more from a rational perspective. So if somebody reads the Gita, there are many verses which can be striking, but there are many verses which can also be challenging. Uh, that, mm -hmm. oh, what does this mean? How does this make sense? So... Each, uh, so the, the Bhagavad Gita Insights re looks at some of the typical questions that may come up for a reader when they read the Gita and I try to address them. I see. So each yeah. of these books has about has, has exactly 100 articles and all of them I try to have some illustrations with them. And it's a 70, 80 illustrations which convey the themes that I'm trying to share. And so 100 reflections approaching the Gita from the emotional perspective, relational perspective, we can say, mm -hmm. a Krishna Arjuna relation, 100 from the rational perspective to understand its concepts. Fascinating. 
now, now um, the Gita itself, you know, if we look at, we're drawing from this broad tradition of, you, you know, it's a tradition of yoga, a tradition of bhakti, or we could call it Vedanta. You know, it, it's a collection of, of literature that goes back many, many centuries, composed in Sanskrit, handed down. Within the tradition, it's believed that this wisdom has been handed down, you know, forever. And, and uh, but, but even, you know, in, in, um, in its literary uh, written form, it's certainly centuries old, and it's vast, right? There's, there's many, many, many texts. It's a tradition of many texts. But of all of these texts, in, as far as I can see, it, it seems that the Bhagavad Gita, which is a, a mere 700 verses, which is in one sense a relatively small uh, text, um, seems to have stood out amongst them all as the most studied, the most quoted, the most um, uh, applicable, or, or, or the most, um, let's say, practiced, as I can see. Would you agree with that? Yes, bro, definitely. I talk about broadly three stages in, in how the Bhagavad Gita has historically been uh, received and spread. Okay. So... The Bhagavad Gita is no doubt a philosophical book. It, at the same time, if, now if you look at the Bhagavatam or other books, they are, they are philosophical. There are of course stories and other things in it. But Bhagavad Gita is, we could say, philosophy in real life. Mm. The setting is that Krish Arjuna has to face a very heart-wrenching ethical dilemma. That he, he has to fight a war against people who are vicious wrongdoers but supporting those wrongdoers are also people are people who are very close to him whom he respects venerates so what does he do should he fight or should he not fight hmm. so so that, that that question which is presented as a as a very real human real dilemma which faces us human beings what is the right thing to do hmm. so the bhagavad gita it's interesting Krishna, when Arjuna asked the question to Arju, uh, Krishna, so what should I do? Pruchami tvam dharma sammudha cheta. So he doesn't ask, should I fight or should I not fight? He doesn't ask also, what is my dharma? He just asks, what is dharma? And here the word dharma means, what is the right thing to do? Hmm. And that is a universal question. So that universal question, because the Gita addresses that, Traditionally, we could say in the medieval times, uh, the Gita became one of the three core books which every major tradition used to try to establish its philosophical base, philosophical credentials. Mm -hmm. that so, was, that so, in a, so in other words, coming out of this broader Ved tr tradition of Vedanta, um, th there's many different schools. And in order yes. to establish their validity in a sense they they comment on three books or... yes okay. so the vedanta sutra is one of them the upanishads are another of them and then the bhagavad gita is the third hmm. so that was one stage where the gita was considered very important especially in establishing a tradition's philosophical credentials then after that when the west started interacting with india during the times of colonialism hmm, that was the time when the Indian tradition seemed to be so vast and incomprehensible that the West wanted to see, is there some book like the Bible, which is like the basis? Mm -hmm. And then that was the time when the Bhagavad Gita became very prominent. In fact, the, among all the books in the Indian tradition, especially the spiritual literature, the Bhagavad Gita is the most translated. In English itself, there are something like 900 translations. Mm -hmm. and there may, 900 reasonably well-known translations. So during that time, the Bhagavad Gita became uh, like the prominent book in the West's eyes of what India's philosophical wisdom is. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then third stage is where in India itself, the Bhagavad Gita began, began to be seen as a book that embodies Indian values and a book that is something which uh, represents India. So the two stages are very similar. But the West started seeing it as the primary book. And in India also, that same recognition came up. So today, 
for most people if they want to know about spiritual india uh, there are many books like the patanjali yoga sutra is there there are, there is of course the bhagavatam is now slowly becoming popular then there is also the for the story the story perspective there is ramayana and mahabharat mm-hmm. but the bhagavad gita if you want wisdom uh, philosophical wisdom about the in broad indian tradition then the bhagavad gita is the go to book now when you mention that uh, i suppose you, you th- that third um phase that you mentioned where it the bhagavad gita becomes popularized as a book that embodies indian values um mm. is, is, like is that even do you see that that that's it's promoted um by by important thinkers that way or even or like within the schools is that the idea and and, and i'm wondering um what are those values yeah that's a good question <laughs> see see what happens is that uh, the the idea of nation itself as we understand it now it was in nations were never understood earlier like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, i could go into a whole history about that but the point here is that as modern as in modern india got independence 1947 and before that also the idea that the bhagavad gita in my understanding has many values but the values which were relevant were especially the value of engaging with the world not just renouncing the world one of the thoughts that pervaded the indian mind was that india was subjected to foreign rule for many centuries because india turned to other worldy mm? mm. and the bhagavad gita was seen as a book which engages encourages respons- responsible engagement with the world and another value is that india is a multilingual multicultural multi religious country and the bhagavad gita embodies those values is the krishna sind bhagavad gita mama vartamanu vartante manushya partha sarvasha that all people are on my path the gita doesn't say my way is the only way in fact it says it ultimately we are on all on one journey of consciousness mm. we're all trying to ex- learn more experience more and grow more i see we may all choose different ways but that so the gita says that is the path that it is describing so in that sense the inclusiveness of the gita mm. was also what uh, what was seen to be embodying the the broad values of india and on a world stage that's can be seen as unique Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And and then you mentioned that this idea of responsible engagement with the world. And and maybe there it differs from a lot of the from the say Upanishads or, or you know um a lot of the other spiritual thought in the East where it may have been a, the the path may have been seen as more um secluded. Uh whereas in the Gita yes. now we're finding like no engaging with the world as a yogi. Yes, exactly. So so if we see in the indian tradition there have been stages but uh, while the renounced uh, aspect of life is important at the same time it was for a particular g- phase in life and for a particular group of people for uh, so for example see we humans in if we want to take it metaphorically you know we humans stand between the earth and the sky hmm? we are tiny but we stand between the earth and the sky so if we consider it on the spiritual evolution there are some people who are already so spiritually inclined or evolved that we could say their heads are already touching the sky so they have no that much interest in the world mm-hmm. so for them renouncing the world is a natural and desirable choice <laughs> yeah it's interesting because <laughs> like i think in india you meet people like that like in america i mean i'm sure there's people that kind of have a lot of that in them but it seems like when you go to india you'll meet like at least as myself as a person that grew up in the united states and then visited india you just i guess cuz it's just more in deep for centuries deeply embedded in 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 that culture that you do meet people that that can display unique amounts of um renunciation i suppose just naturally yes agreed yeah. it is true and of course i would say that maybe you also go to parts of india where people are more spiritually inclined we yeah. fair about that yeah. but yes definitely i have seen that that is true so so for so but what happened was that started spreading to almost everyone 
mm-hmm. and the B- buddhism as it is practiced in the world today it is quite cool and it is quite popular and buddhism is quite world engaging but historically there was a phase when buddhism was in at least in indian history it was quite world rejecting mm-hmm. and to some extent uh, the hindu tradition the vedic tradition also uh, took a similar turn for some time but then the bhagavad gita is a central book which actually focuses on world engagement and mm-hmm. but it is the idea is that you can engage in the world with spiritual consciousness mm-hmm. so the whole thought flow and analysis of the gita is what is it that actually gets attached what is it that gets entangled and how can we prevent that hmm. so that is the core message of the gita it is so gita says that it's not just action that entangles it is we could say emotion or attachment or intention it is motivation that entangles and if we change that then we will not get entangled in the world so that is what it talks about not renunciation of action but renunciation in action hmm. within action right right it, which seems at least as you read the gita it seems like it was a concept that at least to arjuna it seemed to be a very foreign concept like it took him some quite a few chapters to begin to for it to click in his mind yeah that is true what happens for him is he thinks in terms of polarities either i act or i renounce hmm. so because of that when krishna brings in something as a you know if you consider a pendulum action entangles a re- a renunciation disentangles mm-hmm. but the problem with renunciation is he is also conscious of his responsibility in the world mm-hmm. so he says i can renounce the world but i will be failing in my responsibilities if i act i will be doing my responsibility but i'll getting entangled mm-hmm. so if you consider there's two sides of a pendulum the balanced state is something which uh, it takes time for him to appreciate and krishna also talks about that balance at multiple levels how we can achieve that balance that's why there is karma yoga and then there is dhyana yoga and then there is bhakti yoga so all of these provide this so we could say the middle stage of the pendulum it krishna also talks about multiple levels in that hmm. it's it's a uh, it is again i i love how you break things down and and looking at those two polarities and it seems that um a lot of wisdom may lie in recognizing polarity and i don't know maybe assuming but but or let's at least say investigating where there might be some synthesis uh between the two and and a deeper truth may lie there you know we're, we're right now uh on the podcast you know uh weekly we're we're at the point where um in the bhagavatam where indra comes and he steals the horse from mm. from prithu maharaj <laughs> right and so so we have a, a a king who's you know he's in one way taking on a, a very difficult task uh we can imagine at a, a great personal sacrifice to do good for his kingdom to do good for 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 the general population through this ritual and then you have uh indra who's like he's in a very high position um and uh and out of fear and you could say out of a selfish concern he goes and tries to intentionally disrupt that the the you know the well-intentioned um ritual of of prithu um just for an entirely selfish motive and the reactions coming from the sages the reaction coming from the priest from the the or- from the wise men from the religious orthodoxy everybody's saying punish him you know punish you know he deserves punishment and brahma comes and he begins to speak on another level and, and and as you're saying he begins to see that life is complicated right like in other words it's there's a temptation to put everything in a polarity good or bad but throughout mahabharata and and as you mentioned right right at the beginning of the gita we deal with like a situation that's complicated and, and it becomes difficult to understand exactly how to apply principles yes agreed so one of the defi- driving questions of the bhagavad gita is also the driving question of the mahabharat which okay. is a bigger book within which the bhagavad gita is spoken yes. and that is what is dharma what is the right thing to do mm. the bhagavatam of course takes this question and makes it could say more urgent more specific what is the right thing to do at the time of death mm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there is a natural development between the two. And this question that what is the right thing to do, it becomes especially perplexing when we face uh, ethical di- dilemmas. So there are, we all can face different kinds of crossroads in life. Uh, now terms can vary, but I try to differentiate between what we can call as a moral dilemma and an ethical dilemma. A moral oh, dilemma. A, modern? Yeah. A moral, moral, moral Maro, dilemma. Maro. And a, okay. mo- moral, moral. Yes. Mor- morality. So, mm-hmm. so moral dilemma is basically where one choice is moral and the other choice is immoral. Okay. So somebody is uh, maybe in a shopping mall and they see, okay, the camera here is broken. Maybe I can shoplift, I can, I can get away with it. Should okay. I, should I not? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so. <laughs> opportunity is so, there. Yeah, opportunity is there. Mm-hmm. There, were, well, there is a cynical saying, I don't agree with it. She says, most morality is just lack of opportunity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can always test it when, once the opportunity is offered, that, that, that theory becomes tested. Yeah. Yeah, but the point is, in such a situation, should I do it or should I not do it? It just requires moral strength. Okay. Oh, you know, I won't be greedy. I won't do it. Mm-hmm. So that's moral strength required. But ethical dilemmas are where there are two things and both of them are right in their own way. Okay. So which is the more right thing or which is more right in this particular situation? Right. So that is ethical dilemma where mm-hmm. there are two conflicting moral values and both uh, one has to, we have, at that time, one just doesn't just need moral strength. In one sense, one needs a moral framework mm. or a philosophical worldview with a moral framework that places moral values in a hierarchy. That is this, is this a higher morality over here or is this the higher morality over here? And so the Bhagavad Gita is, sometimes the Bhagavad Gita can seem for some people to be like a book of violence because it's spoken on the battlefield. Yeah. But remarkably, the Gita doesn't refer to much to the war at all you know in one sense if uh, if krishna had wanted arjuna to just fight krishna could have just reminded arjuna of all the nasty things Mm. that the opponents had done to his family Mm -hmm. the opponents had even tried to dishonor and disrobe his wife in public yeah that would have been enough for a warrior like arjuna to have his blood boiling and fight But Krishna doesn't even once mention that. Interesting. Because because Krishna's purpose is not just to get Arjuna to fight. Krishna's purpose is to provide Arjuna a framework for sound decision making Mm -hmm. amidst ethical dilemmas. So, okay, very interesting. Can you describe that framework for us? Okay, yeah. Greater detail. yeah, just so, but I just described the ethical dilemma that he was facing. Okay. So there are traditional words that is Arjuna is torn between two dharmas. Dharma is duty or the right thing to do. Okay. So one is his Kshatriya dharma. Kshatriya is, means is a warrior. So the warrior's duty is to protect society from wrongdoers, mm-hmm. protect society from aggressors, uh, disruptors, antisocial elements, basically. And clearly, if we read the broader context of the Mahabharat the opponents, the Kauravas, were lawbreakers. Mm -hmm. So that is his warrior duty was to punish aggressors. But he also has a Kula Dharma. Kula Dharma is dynastic duty. That I'm a part of a family of dynasty and their opponents are also my cousins. They're my relatives. They're my grandfather over there. Mm -hmm. So I have a duty to protect my dynasty. So he's torn between his warrior duty and his dynastic duty. Mm -hmm. So which duty is important? Now, of course, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't get into these specific duties, but it takes that forward. That it takes the forward that, okay, uh, that when somebody is torn between two duties, when we there is an ethical dilemma, how does one move forward? So I try to talk about the Gita in, uh, we could say, four, four, a four-word acronym. You can say, I start with the first uh, basis the Gita gives for... Uh, Analyzing is identity. So before we can decide what is the right thing to do, we have to understand who we actually are. Mm. So to understand who we actually are, that is, the Gita says our identity is that we are spiritual beings. 
so the gita talks about in one sense multiple levels of identity hmm. it doesn't deny our current identity say i am an indian most of you are americans uh, some of us are male some of us are females these are identities but we could say these are more functional identities hmm. that okay. we might change our citizenship we might change we might identify as a profession we might change our profession so these are functional identities but below all functional social other such identities is our fundamental identity uh-huh. so that fundamental identity is that we are spiritual beings so krishna in one sense starts the gita uh, with an approach which is uh, similar to a well known quote of einstein he says that problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness or consciousness that created them mm-hmm. so krishna says if you are only going to think am i a warrior or am i a you know should i do my warrior duty or should i do my dynasty duty functional that, that, that uh, func- both are functional yeah and how do how will you prioritize is this function more important this function more important it says go below the functional level to the fundamental level mm-hmm. so who am i really mm-hmm. that is identity mm-hmm. so now once we get that identity right the the next thing that the gita brings in is divinity okay that divinity is that we all are parts of a reality a cosmic universal or trans cosmic reality beyond ourselves so the the gita's vision of the divine is also very interesting the gita doesn't say that the that god just exists somewhere far away in some abode somewhere this is the gita's vision is that uh, we are inside god and god is inside us hmm. yomam pashyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pashyati so what it means is that the whole of existence is non at one level non different from god in the in the gita the krishna also shows the universal form where all of the universe is the body of god so we are inside god and god is inside us because inside our hearts god exists in a manifestation of his divine called the paramatma the soul is the atma and the paramatma is the supreme soul or is called the super soul so the the implication of this is that we all are integrally parts of the divine mm-hmm. okay which so is because, also a question of identity but i guess it's it's going deeper into that fundamental identity exactly yes so okay. i i am spiritual being but i am not just a isolated fragmented spiritual being i am mm-hmm. a spiritual being who is a part of the supreme spiritual being mm-hmm. mm-hmm. now based on that so then what happens is the third thing the gita talks about is we could say energy we all have certain energy endeavor we all do endeavor but we do the endeavor with the energy so the energy that we have so i use this acronym idea i d e a okay so i talk about identity divinity and energy so our energy is best used in harmony with the divine because we all are parts of the divine so so i try to phrase this as be a part be not a part okay. so <laughs> so be a part we are a part of the divine so let's act as a part of the divine so the gita's vision is that now this when we talk about energy generally we use the word energy as uh, something which is potential which can do things mm-hmm. so our own conceptualization i have free will i have intelligence i have emotions i have all these energies but what am i meant to do with this so krishna tells arjuna that in, going back to the specific situation that don't just think that oh are you going to protect uh, are you going to do your warrior duty or are you going to do your dynasty duty think what is the divine plan for the world what will be for the greater good hmm. and krishna says that it is my my plan to establish dharma establish the order of virtue establish that in the world and for that purpose the the those who are disruptors of dharma have to be removed have to be neutralized so our energy in one sense the bhagavad gita says is it just even in conception our energy means is to be utilized in harmony in a mood of service to the divine mm-hmm. 
and then that brings us to the last part that is activity which starts with an a yeah so idea i d e a so so activity the gita says that activity. that we, if we do it in a mood of service then we are not implicated for our actions okay. so even if somebody does something which is normally considered objectionable say if there is normally even hurting any person is bad but if there is a group of criminals or terrorists running uh, running riot wild in the city and then the police uh, neutralize them mm-hmm. and they risk their lives to do that then that is considered glorious the country will reward them if some uh, rogue state is attacking the borders and the military defends it so th- at this point the 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 soldiers are although they are acting individually they are acting heroically but they are not acting whimsically they are not just killing because they dislike the opposite person mm-hmm. okay i think uh, they are a part uh, of something yeah. but that applies for everyone so when we act say for example we all are parts of units bigger than ourselves we may be part of a family we may be part of a community we may be part of a country so when we act in a mood of service to these greater units that we belong to and ultimately the greatest unit that we belong to is god so activity that is done in the mood of service that will never entangle us that will in fact elevate and ultimately liberate us so that is how so this krishna gives this framework of you could say idea for us to uh, resolve our ethical dilemmas mm. so we could say that identity and divinity are fairly clear but okay how am i meant to use my energy so for that we need prayer we need uh, we need introspection mm-hmm. we may need consult with others and then how can i best serve in this situation if we have that attitude then we will get guidance about how to move ahead through our ethical dilemmas so in other words where one may be concerned about the gita's battlefield setting and one might you know um reasonably be concerned that it seems like an appeal to violence in the name of god um that if one's going to actually engage with this fairly you're going to see that there's that it's it's not such a um simplistic kind of statement that's being made or or, or encouragement that's being made really this book is encouraging one to think very deeply about their own sense of identity um and and, and about how their own, their own sense of divinity and how um what is their more fundamental role in the universe it exactly okay. definitely see violence is uh, it's in one sense in the core message of the gita it is remarkably absent because the gita as i said i talk about this is one of the in fact there are several articles talking about this theme of violence in my book so i talk of it from one perspective is that as i said the gita doesn't even use any of the circumstantial reasons for war although that would have been the easiest way to get to get arjuna to mm-hmm. uh, act so we can look at the content of the gita so i talk about the content the context and the consequence so the content perspective if you see that there is hardly uh, any usage of uh, uh, war, uh, like wo- war fomenting kind violence fomenting kind of language and if you look at arjuna's question so at the start and arjuna's answer at the end in both cases say arjuna's what is what is what is the right thing to do for me what is dharma hmm. and at the end and arjuna doesn't say i will fight he says i will do your will karishye yeah okay. yes karishye vachanam tava so in fact in the end of the gita there is practically last several concluding verses there's no reference at all to war so mm. it's about the messages of message of harmony of yeah arjuna says yes i will harmonize with your will i will do your will so that that, that is the essential message of the gita so in terms of the context if we see what arjuna asks and what arjuna understands as the application of the gita it is a me- message of harmony so, and then in terms of consequence the gita has been influential for thousands of years in india now 
if you consider many of the prominent commentators who wrote on the gita there's ramanujacharya madhavacharya in our tradition we have had in, we are a part of the gaudiya vaishnav tradition where we have vishwanachakra thakur the men uh, and we have baldev vidya bhushan many of these commentators they were living at a time when india was under quite aggressive and iconoclastic islamic rule mm-hmm. lot of temples were desecrated lot of a uh, uh, lot of the uh, father for a lot of uh, rebellion and, and yeah uh, and then, so revolution. and these achar these acharyas were all trying to share the spiritual wisdom and establish a spiritual culture which was being ravaged in front of their eyes but in not one of their commentaries does any of the acharya say that therefore the conclusion of the gita is now all of you should rise and fight against these aggressors mm, interesting point so not one of the traditional commentators even once mentions this mm. so in terms of consec- so that's why in the content context and consequence the gita has never been used as a book for uh, for fomenting violence against anyone so the, it's, it's just so i and then the, the gita you could say that there is you know, there is if you are going to go back to the pendulum and polarities yeah there is that there, there could be silence there could be violence mm. but the gita's message is neither silence nor violence but transcendence it's interesting because <laughs> now just it's a fascinating breakdown that you have there um i never considered it uh, so deeply um but thinking now there are certain places in the gita where krishna actually encourages arjuna to fight right like at the end of the third chapter we find it we'll find it also in the eighth chapter um and i'm and I imagine other places too but I, i'm thinking of both of those contexts it's although he is saying fight it's almost more really what he's asking him to do is to have a certain state of consciousness it's almost assumed that he's going to fight he's asking him to come to a certain yogic state of consciousness as he carries out his duty like that's more where the message is going right like in the third chapter where he's saying you know all he says you know armed with yoga stand and fight but it's in the context yes. of his conquering his his lower nature um his his lower desires that he was saying stand and fight and in the eighth yes. chapter yeah you know, that's yeah. a yeah yeah please. i just i have an article on this topic itself see mm-hmm. this is 441 and 442 krishna tells arjuna to fight So, yeah. tasmad agyana sambhutam ritstam gyana sinatmana chitvainam samshayam yogam atishto tishta bharata so it's interesting what krishna tells him to do is therefore arise and fight but he's telling him fight with what fight with a sword Now, arjuna is not a sword fighter arjuna is a he usually fights with bow and arrow uh, bow and arrow so that is significant and not only that he is telling him fight against what the smart agyana sambhutam ritstam gyana asinatma fight with the sword gyana asin fight with the sword of knowledge against the ignorance in your heart hmm. so what the gita is telling is that the inner fight is actually far more important than the outer fight that in fact if you go a little earlier there is one of my one of my favorite sections in the gita is 336 to 43 where krishna is asked by arjuna what is it that makes us act against our best interests what is it that makes us act self destructively and krishna identifies that self destructive uh, urge by the name kama which you can call it can call as lust but broadly it is it is selfishness it's self centeredness mm-hmm. right but the point is krishna tells arjuna that this is your enemy in the world kamesh krodesh mm-hmm. rajoguna samudba mahakshano mahapapma vidhi enam yah vairanam in this world this is your enemy so we could visualize the gita setting krishna and mm-hmm. arjuna are there <laughs> right. on the on the middle of the bat- in the middle of the battlefield there are thousands of forces on both sides and krishna is telling arjuna is not pointing to any of the enemies on the opposite they are your enemies so no this this craving this urge for self destructive indulgence that is your enemy in the world mm. and that is the enemy you need to conquer so the gita emphasizes the inner war against our own lower nature against our own self destructive urges that is far more emphasized in the gita 
and in fact wherever the war imagery or war terminology is used it is always in context with a, either the combination of the inner and outer war or even more uh, in the com- context of the inner war mm. so now how does this inner war and outer war relate so the gita's message here is that so there are some people see in one sense lust anger greed the gita calls these as three gates to hell and it is uh, it is actually if you look at most of the crimes in the world today we can trace them down to these three things lust is related to all the sexual of offenses and crimes greed is related with uh, most of the corruption and everything that goes on with capital when it capitalism goes wild or even communism in its own way and the power, those in power take uh, those in power become arrogant and possessive so and then of course anger leads to all kinds of, of uh, violence even when just small things become explosive mm-hmm. so most of the crimes you can trace to lust anger greed so it's not just that lust anger greed take one to hell some other hell they in one sense bring hell into this world they make mm-hmm. they can make our world hellish so the gita's vision is that each of us has to fight against these mm-hmm. and that is what every responsible person needs to do in fact fighting against the self destructive cravings within us uh, that is our primary responsibility mm-hmm. but unfortunately some people stop fighting against these and start fighting for these that means some people start working they use their intelligence they use their energy they use all their resources to fulfill their greed mm-hmm. to fulfill their lust and such people so we could call them as psychopaths some people just get pleasure in causing pain to others they very perverse mentality so such people need to be forcefully stopped so though so we the gita's core message is to encourage all of humanity to fight the inner war against our lower desires by activating our higher nature mm-hmm. but for those people who are not ready to fight this war well there are ways to regulate them in society that's what government is for but for those who are actively fighting for these inner forces then they are a menace to society mm-hmm. and so krishna is helping arjuna reenvision the war this is not just a war against your relatives this is not just a war for some kingdom this is not just you're fighting against your relatives actually you are fighting against those who have become enemies of the world because they have they have started fighting for their for the self destructive forces within them so such people do need to be stopped so that's how the inner war and the outer war yeah. can be correlated the far more yeah so far, just to conclude this so yes. the far more universal message is about the inner war that's what right. is universal for everyone but specifically in the context fighting the inner war uh, for society for in society for people to fight the inner war sometimes an outer war has to be fought against some people who have uh, who have you could say become instruments for their lust anger greed So again <clears throat> here's an example of <clears throat> uh finding a synthesis you know not not swing to either end of the polarity because some commentators i believe gandhi mentioned that like if the battlefield setting of the gita refers to a real battle then i'm not interested in it or something like that right although he although yeah. he drew very deeply from the gita um it seems like he was prone to say that the that the um the setting was entirely allegorical or, or something like that. Yes. Um where where what you're saying is it's not that it's entirely allegorical but the battle that's being spoken about if you go deeper into this book you're going to find it's it's a it's a very different battle that it's that is its, its emphasis. Yes, exactly. So the challenge that has come over here is that the the I talk about three things you know you you, you read a book you read from a book and you read into a book hmm? say that again okay read a book <laughs> read a book read a book read fro- from a book mm-hmm. and read into a book okay so okay read a book means okay i just want to know what this book is saying but then read from a book means okay this is the section of the book i found find very inspiring very relevant 
I'll focus on that. I'll read more on it. This is what I want to apply in my life. This is what I want to share. So first and second are perfectly fine. They're they're desirable. That's what we we can't keep all the book in mind. Right. Uh, all the time. But read into a book means what? We have our own preconceptions, and we impose those on the book. Mm-hmm. So and what that, happens with? Yeah. So unfortunately, you could say, yeah, you can, you can say, what are you saying? Well, I was going to say, that's not, it's not uncommon that that's been done in Gita commentaries. Oh, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So Srila Prabhupada, he wrote a, a Gita commentary, which he called uh, as Bhagavad Gita as it is. Mm-hmm. Now, that is sometimes that can sound like a, uh, like a presumptuous title, mm-hmm. as it is. But his point was that the Gita has very clear conclusions. Right. See, the Gita is very inclusive in its message. Mm-hmm. It is very broad. different people they can read different things from the gita and that is fine but the gita is very clear in its conclusion when prabhupada said bhagavad gita as it is he was focusing that he is giving the conclusion of the gita very clearly mm-hmm. in fact not only clearly he gives it consistently throughout the book right mm-hmm. prabhupada doesn't get in his gita commentary he doesn't get so much into the technicalities of the gita and its various analysis of this level and that level he does address it but not too much he's focusing on the conclusion but mm-hmm. prabhupada would say that some gita commentaries are not bhagavad gita as it is they are bhagavad gita as you want it to be or bhagavad gita <laughs> as you are <laughs> as you so are. <laughs> so that's reading into it yeah okay. so with all due respects to gandhi ji i used to read his I, i read his several of his books before i was introduced to bhakti i read his gita commentary also so what happened was he was already a uh, he could say a fan or a proponent of non violence yeah and then he read that into the gita mm-hmm. and in fact uh, although he he ha- he is a extraordinary person in his own way he writes in the introduction that i would like to say that humbly submit that vyasadev has committed a serious mistake mm. vyasadev is the person who put the put the vedic scriptures in writing he said that he has used the the war as an allegory as a metaphor but this is a metaphor that is very likely to be misunderstood and misapplied mm-hmm. so i feel that he shouldn't have used this metaphor right so it it's it's you may say he's humble but it's quite presumptuous to think that, so he didn't consider that maybe there's some other, some reason why he used that metaphor so yeah very interesting so let's yeah. into the I, you know i i feel you know as and i think we've discussed this with you on some previous uh uh the previous times you've been on the show but it it does feel that um you know in the past decade or so the polarity has increased a lot you know politically and in the social discourse mm-hmm. and uh it's my own impression is that i think i see people of different uh political bents reading into spiritual literature more than i've, I've ever noticed before <laughs> you know like the, the 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 tendency to read into the book it, it seems to be um popping up all over the place i don't know if you feel similar yes that is very true what has happened is that you could say there's a difference between ideas and ideologies mm-hmm. so people have ideas ideologies have people so now uh, ideology is not a bad thing but if you have an ideology which reduces the world view of a person mm-hmm. see whatever intellectual tools we have they are meant to help us understand reality but the temptation is that once we acquire an intellectual tool we reduce reality to fit into that intellectual tool mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and although the bhagavad gita itself in one sense you can say it's an intellectual tool but the bhagavad gita says that many places ultimately reality is irreducible it's far more complex than what we can understand yeah. krishna says the way karma works is very difficult to understand gahana karmano gati how action and reactions correlate krishna says his own nature is divine nature his glory is unlimited though very difficult to understand so the gita provides us a philosophy but it also focuses on humility that see uh, but what happens for some people when they they are certain about something this is how it is and then after that they just once they are certain that this is how it is everything is reduced to their particular world view mm-hmm. so what is that saying that if somebody has a hammer the whole world appears to be like nails 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so want to, something to hammer. So yeah. we try to so so that's now some in, because we could say that there is some amount of spiritual resurgence in the world. At least people are becoming more and more open to spirituality. So if somebody can quote from a spiritual text to support their ideas, then they get a little more credibility. Mm-hmm. So that's what people are doing. And yes, in the Gita, uh, just to talk about this in the Gita, the Gita says that it is uh, important that we avoid the temptation to find faults. Aversion to fault finding is a virtue, a paishunam. So uh, with respect to the problems of the world, this is something which I find quite, you could say either uh, funny or tragic. And if you ask people, you know, what is the problem? What is the actual problem? Okay, you know, why is there a, why is there a war between Ukraine and Russia? Or why is the inflation increasing so much? Or why is there poverty in the world? Why is there climate change? Now, most people may not be able to very clearly explain what the problem is. But those very people are very certain who is the cause of the problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this, this evil capitalist, this evil dictator, this evil. So, <laughs> so what happens yeah. is that it seems almost within the human psyche, uh, this is the conditioned human psyche, there is a need to find a villain. Mm-hmm. There is a need to find a villain. So, what happens? And it works both ways. If there is a villain, I can be a hero who is, right. who is gloriously fighting against that villain. And if I cannot be a hero, if I'm in trouble, then at least I can get to play the victim. <laughs> and I can <laughs> give, me a, give me a role. Give me a good role one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> so, that temptation to find a villain the Bhagavad Gita is so remarkable. Krishna doesn't just tell that avoid avoid finding faults, avoid looking for a villain. It doesn't just say that, it teaches that. Because mm. the Gita throughout doesn't point to the opponents as the villain. So right. that's why this polar what you're talking about, the polarization that is there in the today's world. It is all rather than addressing issues, we just want to find villains and blame villains. Mm. And we can avoid that. Uh, if we actually understand the mood of the Gita and its message also. We, we're, we're almost out of time, but even earlier this week on our show, we were discussing, you know, there, there's a term that's become popularized recently, gaslighting. You're probably familiar with it. Yes. Right. And it's, it's you know, it certainly is, it's a concern that people can be manipulative in how they, particularly with people that they have an influence over and, and um, rather than deal with a real important issue, uh, you encourage a person to think that it's their own fault or something like that. Um, and I see the political discourse or the social discourse seeping into the spiritual discourse and ideas like gaslighting being applied. But factually, you know, the, the, the sacred text of all these spiritual traditions, they encourage us to introspect, right? It, it's it's an mm. a very essential part of spirituality <laughs> is to look within oneself and, and, and to recognize the movements of the world in one sense to relativize them um, and, and, to, and to see them as impetus to look within. Mm, uh, and, true, and, definitely. And, and so if, um, if we're quick to apply these kind of concepts to spirituality without going deeper, and, and that's what I like so much about what you've shared with us today, like taking one concept, um, resisting the urge to immediately categorize it according to our you know our our um our psychological or, or intellectual tendencies and 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 rather than read into the text um go very deep into try to understand the different layers of of wisdom that's there um then it's only then that we're actually getting to transformation and it's transformation is what's actually needed to solve all these problems you know yeah definitely you just i'll make two quick points this Please. Is very the Gita talks about a very fascinating concept called knowledge in the mode of ignorance. Mm-hmm. So normally we consider knowledge and ignorance as opposite things. But in 1822, it says, It says that when one takes one part of reality 
and makes mm-hmm. it the total reality mm-hmm. then what happens is that person is having knowledge but that knowledge is not removing their ignorance that knowledge is reinforcing their ignorance mm-hmm. so if mm-hmm. i am biased against someone then the news may talk about new in the news there may be how oh that community is good also they do so many good things but i will zero in on the news about how that community is bad and i will have 100 examples of all that that community did bad mm-hmm. so i have knowledge but that knowledge is only reinforcing my bias mm-hmm. so knowledge in ignorance means knowledge that increases our ignorance it doesn't decrease our <laughs> ignorance <laughs> because we live in a world where there's so such accessibility to knowledge now maybe we're becoming more ignorant yeah. than ever before <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's that what in social media they call it once like echo chamber a social media yeah. bubble people yeah. live inside that itself and this actually applies even in religious traditions i'll conclude with this mm-hmm. some people equate faith with certainty mm-hmm. if i have faith in god that i am certain this is right and everything else is wrong i was in texas once and i was anybody was taking me for a program and i was in front of that saw a car which said you know Uh, it's obviously belong to some evangelical christian he said that, no no disrespect to christianity but just mm-hmm. says god said it i accept it that settles it <laughs> <There you go. laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so no uh, need to look is, more deeply into this <laughs> so but then what happens with this is the problem with this is that life is complex and mm-hmm. god has said 100 things which particular thing to apply where right. so 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 p some people equate faith with certainty but sometimes that certainty is not an expression of faith it is an expression of ego mm. oh, i am right and you are wrong right. and in contrast these people sometimes equate uncertainty with lack of faith uh-huh. but uncertainty can be a sign of humility <laughs> that reality is far more complex than what i and can immediately understand even what i the the books of wisdom that i am referring to they are also complex so therefore faith can sometimes uh, be better expressed through humility than certainty mm-hmm. yes there are certain bedrock truths there are some bedrock truths of which we are certain that the existence of god the existence of soul the pursuit of spirituality as life's primary purpose these are there but with respect to many specific issues in the world no if we approach them with greater humility rather than greater certainty we could avoid much more conflict and we could help create a better world sage advice from the spiritual scientists thank you so much uh for coming on again it, it's everything you say so about and you got this, you have unlimited things like this to share to find more please visit the spiritual scientist.com or also geetadaily.com Uh, I I recommend people check in every day. You get a little something from it. It'll it'll um it'll really deepen your insight. Thank you for so much for coming on again. Thank you. Happy to be a side here. <laughs>